Hey, welcome to worship. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Selkirk United Church online service for September 20th. May God be with us today as we worship and every day that we are blessed with. I'd like to welcome all of you who are watching, whether you are a longtime member of Selkirk United or a newcomer or a visitor, whether you've watched every one of these services religiously, or it's your very first time joining us or somewhere in between. Welcome. Glad you are here and you are part of the family. Selkirk United is an inclusive, affirming, and welcoming community of faith where we seek God's guidance in helping us become the people we were created to be. We also acknowledge that we worship on Treaty 1 land within the homeland of the Métis Nation. We begin our service, as always, by lighting the Christ candle and the rainbow candle. Our first hymn is a hymn of praise. I hope that you sing it out wherever you are. Go ahead and try to wake up the neighbors. Let's sing together number 245 in Voices United. Praise the Lord with the sound of trumpets. sound of trumpet praise the lord with the harp and lute praise the lord with the gentle sounding flute praise the lord in the field and forest praise the lord in the city square praise the lord anytime and Praise the Lord in the dark of night. Praise the Lord in the rain or snow, for in the morning light. Praise the Lord in the deepest valley. Praise the Lord on the highest hill. Praise the Lord, never let your voice be still. Praise the Lord with the crashing cymbal. Praise the Lord with the pipe and string. Praise the Lord with the joyful songs you sing. Praise the Lord on a weekday morning. Praise the Lord on a Sunday noon. Praise the Lord by the light of sun or moon. sorrow. Praise the Lord in the time of joy. Praise the Lord every moment. Nothing let your praise destroy. Praise the Lord in the peace and quiet. Praise the Lord in your work and play. Praise the Lord everywhere in every way. Let us bow our heads for a prayer of approach. Let us pray. Gracious God, who offered bread to desert wanderers, loving God, who feeds all who hunger, join with us here, we pray. Let those wounded and lost find hope. Let friends recognize Christ in one another. Let all the world satisfy its hunger for bread and for peace until children and elders, enemies and friends all smile together. Be with us as we worship and throughout this coming week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Quite a few announcements to pass along today. First, our Sac Religion gathering is uh, back this week on Tuesday again. We will be meeting one o'clock 
Tuesday afternoon using Zoom. If, our, if uh, any of you are wanting to join us for the first time, let me know and I will send you, along with all the other ones, an invitation. Our online Sunday school has started up as well uh, as our first online youth gathering last Sunday. Thanks to Liz and Miranda and Chris for all the work that uh, you continue to do with the young people of our church family. For online Sunday school, I understand that uh, people can receive, can expect to receive a package in the mail with a list of items they'll need for, for the lessons. And uh, the story and class will be online, so it's convenient for all. This past week, during my Questions for Cole episode, I asked for all of you to send in your thoughts and ideas about other small group gatherings that we're going to try to have at the church over the next while. I'm not going to repeat the whole announcement here. If you're interested in seeing the whole thing, you can check out the latest episode of Questions online. But what we're hoping to hear from all of you is, first of all, whether you'd come out to a small group gathering at the church if we offered one. And secondly, what kind of gathering would most interest you? Could be anything from a small prayer service or prayer group to a Bible study to an informal gathering just to get together and see each other after being apart for so long. This wouldn't replace our online services, but would be something that a few people at a time could sign up for and at least get together and see how we're all doing. One suggestion was to call it Coffee with Coal. So let us know what you think, whether you'd come out and what you'd like to see happen. You can email either cole at selkirkunitedchurch.ca or chris at selkirkunitedchurch.ca. Love to hear from you. We've had some requests for both baptism and confirmation in the past few months, and that's confirmation for adults and youth. So if you or anyone you know is interested in either confirmation or baptism, make sure you let us know soon. We'll be going ahead with those uh, in the next while. I also have an announcement to share about an anti-racism training workshop that is coming up soon. It's a two-day workshop sponsored by the Islamic Social Services Association. And there are three different dates that the workshop is being offered. One in September, that's this coming week, Thursday and Friday, I believe. One in October and another in November. If anyone is interested in attending, you can either contact Deb Caustic or the office for more information. We have some celebrations to share with you, some more September celebrations. The Uzdebskis are celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary today. A very happy anniversary to Chris and Myron. Congratulations. Also, we have some happy birthday wishes going out to some special people this week. Happy birthday to Faye Gillespie, who celebrated on Wednesday, and happy birthday to Erna Iwanachko, who I believe is celebrating today. Happy birthday to both of you. And I don't like to reveal people's ages unless I have permission, but I do believe that both of those were significant ones. Nice round numbers, lots of circles involved. So congratulations. And another birthday, also happy birthday to Jack Elliott, who is also celebrating in September. Keep those celebrations coming in. We've also had some wonderful congregational pictures that have been sent in lately from some of you. Keep them coming. We loved seeing them up on our website page. And if you'd like to be one of our video online greeters at the beginning of these services, let us know. We're still looking for some more of you to, to offer a welcome to the congregation as we begin our Sunday morning services. If there are other announcements that you'd like to share with the rest of the church family, send them in and we will share them either midweek or on Sunday. For our children's time today, I have a book that I'd like to share with you. This one's one of those Mercer Mayer books about the little critters. This one's called Being Thankful, and uh, I thought it was uh, a good time to share this. We're still almost a month from Thanksgiving, but uh, the scripture reading today is going to be about uh, the Israelites wandering through the wilderness and grumbling and complaining, and that reminded me of this children's book about someone who was a bit grumbly and complainy. And you'll see as the story unfolds, they learned about being thankful. Being Thankful by Mercer Mayer. I stopped my scooter in front of the toy store. Wow, I wish I had a Speed Blaster Double Z scooter with silver wheels, I said. You already have a scooter, said my mom. It's not nearly as good as the Speed Blaster Double Z, I said.
On our way home, we passed the movie theater. Boy, I wish I could go to the movies, I said. But we're going to watch a movie at home tonight, said my mom. We did watch a movie on our TV, but it wasn't nearly as good as going to the movie theater, even if we did have popcorn. The next day at school, Gator was wearing brand new AR Flyer sneakers. I wished I had brand new AR Flyer sneakers instead of my plain old blue ones. At home, when it was little sister's turn to use the computer, I asked when I was going to get a computer of my own. But you have a computer, said my mom. Sharing isn't as good as having your own computer, I said. At dinner, I said I wished we could go out to a restaurant to eat. I like having dinner at home, said my dad. Don't you wish we had a bigger house with a pool and an elevator, I asked. I like our house just the way it is, said my mom. As we were reading before bed, dad stopped the story and said, there are a lot of people who would love to have things like ours. You should be thankful for what you have instead of focusing on what you don't have. On Saturday, Tiger's dad took us for a ride in his boat. I wish we had a boat, I said. Going on a boat ride is fun, said my dad. Not as much fun as a ride on your own boat, I said. The next day, our whole family went out for ice cream. The boy behind us got a giant ice cream sundae with whipped cream and a cherry on top. I wish I had a sundae instead of this boring cone, I said. But little sister bumped into me and I dropped my ice cream cone. Look what you did, I said. I wish I had a big brother instead of a dumb little sister like you. Little sister started to cry. Say you're sorry, little critter, said my mom. You didn't want your ice cream anyway. The next day I went to Grandma and Grandpa's farm. I helped Grandma feed the chickens. See how happy the chickens are to eat their seeds? Grandma asked. I smiled. Grandma was right. Next I helped her feed the pigs. See how happy the pigs are to eat our leftover food, said Grandma. Cute little piggies, I said and smiled again. It felt good to make the farm animals happy. Then we picked blueberries. I wanted blueberry pancakes, but Grandma and I made Grandpa's favorite blueberry pie instead. That made Grandpa happy. I wanted to pet White Kitty. But then Gray Kitty jumped in my lap, so I petted her instead. That made Gray Kitty happy. After that, I wanted to watch TV, but instead Grandpa played his ukulele, and Grandma and I sang along. That made everyone happy. The next morning, I found a blue rock next to my bed. Why did you give me a rock, Grandma? I asked. It's a thankful rock. I have one too, Grandma said. She showed me her green rock. Remember how happy the farm, animal, farm animals were with what they had? And how happy we can be when we decide to appreciate what we have? I nodded. Then Grandpa pulled his thankful rock from his pocket. That's what it means to have gratitude, to be thankful for everything in your life, said Grandpa. Sometimes when I forget, I look at my thankful rock and I praise God for God's goodness and for all the things I'm thankful for, like you, little critter. When I got home, little sister yelled, 
I wish I got to go to the farm instead of staying here in our boring old house. Mum looked at me. And I wish I had brand new purple overalls with silver sparkles like Bunny instead of these yucky old pink ones. And I wish... Little sister, I said, I brought you something. I gave little sister a red, thankful rock. I explained what Grandma and Grandpa told me about being thankful. When I start wishing for stuff, I look at the rock and remember all the good stuff I already have, I said. Then I start feeling happy again. Try it. You'll see. Little sister gave me a hug. The next day, little sister took her thankful rock everywhere she went. She even kept it on her pillow that night. I think she looks happier already. The end. Thanks for listening, everyone. And now our children's song, 92 and more voices, Like a Rock. Feel free to join in the, in, in the actions if you know them. Scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 to 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat in, in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up, up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Hear these words of scripture. May the Spirit guide us. A minister in British Columbia was talking with the children one Sunday morning about the Hebrew Exodus and how the children of Israel were fed manna in the wilderness. Now, said the minister, can anyone tell me where manna comes from? A little hand shot up right away in the front row, very excited. I know, I know. Well, good, said the minister. Where do you think manna comes from? 
The young girl in the front row answered hopefully. Manitoba? <laughs> I like that. Here in Manitoba, let's take some ownership of that story, shall we? Maybe it is about us. In the story, Moses and the Israelites are in the wilderness, grumbling and complaining. That does sound like us, doesn't it? But let's try not to focus on all the grumbling and complaining, but rather the good news in the story, the manna in the story. God still sends manna to us today in Manitoba and elsewhere in many different forms. If we're watching for it, if we're ready for it, we'll notice, we'll receive it. In the original story, God did send them this manna to satisfy their thirst. And God also sent them quails to satisfy their hunger. The Israelites may not have stopped grumbling and complaining about things, but hopefully they slowly realized that God was indeed with them through all of their trials and tribulations and that God always would be with them. I wondered as I read the Exodus passage this week whether or not the grumbling and complaining helped at all. You think it got God's attention? You think that God was ignoring the plight of the Israelites up until that point? And if it wasn't for their complaining that they might not have survived? I don't think so. If you've ever been on a long trip with kids in the back seat, you'll know that complaining doesn't actually help bring about positive results. In fact, sometimes things get even worse. It certainly doesn't make the trip go any smoother or more quickly. So in spite of the sermon title being more complaining, I think we can agree that more complaining is actually not helpful, either in biblical situations or in our own circumstances. Last Sunday, we heard another story from Exodus about the Israelites escaping from danger and, and God being with them. That was the story about the crossing of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds. Again, there was a lot of grumbling and complaining by the Israelites. The Egyptians were after them and wanted to kill them, and they blamed Moses, and they blamed God. But God was still with them, both in Egypt and during their escape, again in spite of the complaining, not because of it. We start to see a pattern or a theme in the book of Exodus. The Israelites are always grumbling and complaining, it seems, maybe for a good reason, because they always seem to be running into problems. They're hungry or thirsty, they're in the wilderness, they're being chased by the Egyptians, they always seem to be facing life and death situations. We would probably be complaining too. But they don't seem to clue into the fact that God always seems to be there to help them with whatever dangers or problems that they're faced with. Why do you think it is that the people in these scripture stories couldn't trust God? God seems to have bailed them out over and over and over again, but they continue to grumble and complain against Moses and against God. They had no faith that God would provide them with what they needed to survive. Why? Maybe it's just human nature. Was their grumbling and complaining any different than ours? We too are provided with all we need for an abundant life, but boy, do we complain, don't we? I've actually had a lot of experience with this. First of all, I grew up in a family of four children now, we had a really good childhood, but I do remember that my older brother and I complained a lot. I think the problem was that we were both basically lazy, not when it came to sports or fun things to do. I think it was just around the area of chores, work. We would grumble and complain every time the grass needed to be mowed or the dishes needed to be washed or the garden needed to be weeded or the snow needed to be shoveled or our room needed to be cleaned up. Pretty well anything that involved physical labor. And I know some of you who grew up on a farm are laughing at me and thinking, boy, did you have it easy. You should have tried growing up on a farm. I'm sure you're right. But we thought we had it pretty tough. I don't remember quite as much grumbling and complaining from my younger sister, but I think that was because she was the only girl and she was spoiled rotten. At least that's what I like to tell her whenever I get the chance. And then my younger brother came along, and the way I remember it, he was a grumbler and complainer too, even though he was the youngest and was spoiled even more rotten than my sister. Then I went to university and to theological college, and I thought the complaining was bad at home. You should see 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds studying for Greek exams and for early church history and systematic theology and philosophy. 
You almost have to cover your ears, it's so bad. Then I moved to rural Manitoba in the summer of 1992. Some people said that it was the wettest year that they could ever remember. We weren't sure if it was normal for that area to not see the sun for two months straight, but it was getting pretty ridiculous. And the grumbling and the complaining, pretty bad. Maybe the worst I'd seen yet. I thought the theology students were bad. Since that first year in rural Manitoba, I've come to respect farmers as very good complainers. The really good ones can complain about it being too dry one day and too wet the next. Of course, when your livelihood is tied to the weather, you have good reason to worry about it. I guess it was the same with the Israelites. They were talking about their very survival. But God did continue to provide, even if at times it seemed doubtful, even if at times it seemed hopeless. I suggest that we too are provided with what we need if we really think about it, actually much more than we need. Now that doesn't mean that everything is always in abundance for us. It also doesn't mean that we always have everything we want. But we almost always have everything we need, especially when we spread it around. It takes a lot of faith and a lot of trust to believe that God will always provide and to not worry or complain to God when things are not going well. Sometimes when it seems as though God has abandoned us, it may be that we're just not looking for God in the right places. That happened to the Israelites a lot. It wasn't that God had abandoned them, not at all. They just weren't looking in the right places. Moses helped his people to see that God had been there all the time. In these Exodus readings, we can see the hand of God working through ordinary situations to help the people of Israel. And we're not talking about miracles here, although they must have seemed like miracles at the time. We're talking about the resources and gifts that are around us every day, just waiting for us to notice. Last week we heard about Moses and the Israelites crossing the Sea of Reeds, and we heard that it was not a miraculous parting of the waves that saved them, although that is what the story has become. It was actually the natural ability of the Israelites who were traveling on foot to get across a boggy, marshy area, while the Egyptian army with their heavy chariots and horses sank and could not pursue them. God was indeed present with the Israelites, but God didn't really stretch the laws of nature to help them. God merely guided them through their leader Moses to see that there was a way, and that way had been there all the time. And then today's reading was about the manna and the quails. In the early summer, several types of desert trees and shrubs in that area, notably the tamarisk, exude a sweet, sticky substance such as this appears to have been. It drips to the ground, crystallizes, and turns white. The comparisons which liken the manna to hoarfrost and the observation that it tasted like wafers made with honey show that this substance is exactly what the Israelites found. In fact, it was actually a sweet juice that oozed from the natural vegetation of the area. But to the Israelites, it must have seemed like a miraculous manna from heaven sent by God for their very survival. It's fitting that God provided just enough for them to eat. They could not hoard it or save it in any way. They had just enough. Such a good lesson there. This manna was gathered fresh every morning because it was exposed. if it was exposed to the sun, it melted, and if it was kept overnight, it went bad. Perhaps that is a lesson for our present world, where much of our problems lie in the fact that the very rich have far too much hoarded away that they could never ever use up, and the very poor don't have even enough to feed their families each day. God provides enough for everyone, but it is still up to God's people to distribute God's gifts fairly. The quail were also given to the Israelites by God so that they could have food to eat, but again we find that this was not an unusual event. The quail is still a well-known migratory bird in the Egypt-Palestine region. In the book of Numbers, later in the Bible, it is reported that the wind blew the, blew the birds in from the sea. In that account of the story, they began coming in the evening, and by morning they surrounded the camp at the distance of a day's journey. In this account, they are flying directly over the camp. The quails are exhausted, so the Israelites have very little trouble gathering them for food. 
It's important to understand here that the Israelites didn't get help from God because they grumbled and complained. The help was there all along. They just didn't have faith that it was there. They were so worried about tomorrow's needs that they didn't realize what God was offering them today. And each day, just enough for that day. It's also important to realize that God doesn't treat some people better than others because they deserve it more than others or because they complain more. And God doesn't give more generously to some people than to others. God has created a planet with enough resources for all, if we know where to look and if we learn how to share. That's what the Israelites struggled with in Moses' time, and we continue to struggle with it today. Maybe that youngster who guessed that manna comes from Manitoba wasn't so far off after all. In fact, I think she was right on. Isn't it true that God provides for God's people wherever they may be? So if we are in Manitoba, then God provides for us here. We just need to know where to look and how to share, how to distribute our resources equitably, and to cry out for justice when there are people who really don't have enough. Help to figure out the reasons why and work for change. That's true in Manitoba and everywhere else. The scriptures tell us that in the wilderness, God gave the people manna and quail, six days out of seven when they thought that they wouldn't survive. The surrounding stories in Exodus tell us that God kept providing for the people in the wilderness for 40 years, always just enough for survival if they worked together and had faith. That seems to me like a pretty good blueprint for how we can get through our own wilderness times, these times we're living in now, for example, maybe without all the grumbling and complaining although that might be too much to ask. May God be with us through all that we face, pulling us together, giving us strength, both in body and in spirit, as we journey on. Amen.
Let us bow our heads now as I offer a prayer for the offering. Let us pray. Accept our gifts today, O God, as a token of our thanks for all the blessings that surround us. May these gifts and our talents be an inspiration to us and others to build a better world in which all have enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let us continue with our prayers of the people. Let us pray. Holy and infinite God, God of all descriptions and po all possibilities, embrace us and love us, we pray as you continue to transform in us the message of what it is to truly love, to follow in your way of love. Holy Comforter and Companion, in the awe and wondering, in our hope and in our despair, each of us asks, how could this be in my own life? Show me where I fit into this plan of yours. God, hear our prayers as we ask you these questions ourselves. God, we lift to you our joys and concerns, our hopes and confessions, naming them in our hearts and on our lips. We have special prayers this day for those people who are in our hearts and minds this morning who need our prayers this day. We pray for Bill, Donna, Jan, Helen, Mickey, Dawn and Dell, Richard, Elaine, Ian and Ryan, Marcus, Cairo, Brett, Helen, Edie, Deb, and Shirley. Hear our prayers for Brooke, for Scott, for Donna, and for Joanne. God, hear these prayers and the prayers of our hearts. We pray that your comfort and your care will be felt by all who need it, this week and always. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now for our creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating. Who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new. Who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church. To celebrate God's presence. To live with respect in creation. To love and serve others. To seek justice and resist evil. To, to proclaim, proclaim Jesus, Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge, judge and our, our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. with dread. 
drenching spray and torn with many a rift. If hope but light the waters press and Christ my part will lose, I'll seek the seas at his behest and brave another cruise. It is the wind of God that I think the words on the banner behind me make a good benediction for today. Give thanks to God, for God is good. Thank you for joining us for worship today. As we end this time of worship, let us not stop living out our calling as God's thankful people. May we go forth with a renewed sense of service to God and a deepened awareness of God's gifts to us. Go in the peace of Christ, friends, and may God go with you. Amen. Thanks for joining us and make it a great week.